You're listening to South Pod, Rise of a Region, hosted by Stanfield Gray and John Yarian. Greetings and welcome to South Pod. I am John Yarian, your host, and I am coming to you from the conference itself. We're at the Gilliard in sunny Charleston, South Carolina, and I am pleased to be joined by Dave Weisberger, co-founder and CEO of Coin Routes, fresh off the stage, I believe. Is that right, Dave? Yes, sir. Tremendous. Uh, thank you for joining us, and before we get into the business, to what you do, and some of your amazing achievements, I'm curious first, about your relationship to the South. Now, I don't detect much of a Southern accent. I don't know if you travel much in the South. What, what is the nature of the South to you? And this is not a trick, you give me nothing. I'm not actually gonna, there's no punishment no, it's here. Actually, it's actually interesting. Uh, my very first failure was ah. in a company that, uh, a startup that I had done in the 1980s, believe it or not. I believe it. In Texas. Now I know Texas Texans would not like to be grouped in with the South. No, they would. I'm pretty good at a Texan accent. I once went 10 days on a bet being able to talk like a Texan. Now I understand it's not the same as the accent down here and I wouldn't want to try to do a South Carolina accent, but I'm pretty good at it. But 10 days. 10 days. I could probably do the whole interview like this if you wanted, but people would see it I and wonder what was going really on. I am really interested in that bet. I'm going to let it go because we have more important things to talk about, but maybe later we'll catch up on it. But Please continue. I've been to Charleston several times uh, in a different life not that long ago. I worked for Citigroup, and we purchased a company called ATD, and yeah. one of the founders of ATD, yeah. Steve Swanson, is actually in Saw the conference him a minute here. Ago. Yeah, right so here. he's down here. So. Yeah and uh, one of the guys who used to run sales for me and a division I ran at City called Lava Trading is permanently based in Charleston. So I know a few people down here and I know that there's a lot of booming technology businesses both here and in your neighbor to the north yeah. up around uh, you know, the, the Winston-Salem, Raleigh-Durham yeah. area. So yeah. when you're doing financial technology, you always want to be aware of where there might be talent and that could easily play as my company expands, although now it's a little bit premature. Well, we're just glad to know you speak the language fluently. <laughs> that, 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 that means a lot to me. So tell us a little bit about the company, um, how it came about, and, and where it stands today. Well, the, the origin story is actually awesome because one of the things that's interesting is I've been in the business of equity automation for over 30 years and understand equity market structure, started in program trading, have done quantitative trading, have run two broker dealers, one of my friends who used to run FINRA, Rick Ketchum, referred to people like me as market structure geeks. And, and I take that very seriously, and I don't think geeks are a problem or bad. Actually, the Big Bang Theory, I give it a lot of credit because <laughs> it helped make geeks like me seem semi-cool. Although, you know, etc. I sure. view myself as the Leonard archetype because I married the hot blonde. Okay. And just like in the show, there's more to her just than looks, so that's all good. But what happened in my particular case was my son, who started programming a long time ago, believe it or not, he's been programming professionally for over a decade, he came to me with the idea that cryptocurrencies were going to be the next big thing and the markets really needed to be fixed. And he used words from his experience because he was in advertising technology or ad tech, so he called it exchange mediation. I understood what he meant to be smart order routing. And so we sat together, I wrote the specifications, he programmed the system, and we built a full product suite around smart order routing and data aggregation, and that's what Coin Routes is. We have three patents pending, one for a client deployed smart order router, one for a unique way of consolidating the best bids and offers across the industry with filtering, and the other for something we call real price which answers the question, what does it cost at any moment in time to buy or sell a defined number of Bitcoin or Ethereum? And that's important because we can answer a question for people who are looking at the futures markets, what's the spot market at? We give them that ready-made answer. And that's something that is also useful for benchmarks, et cetera. So we decided to do something crazy in this industry. We built a product before we decided to start fundraising. And frankly, we have yet to raise money. It's still all self-funded and we're already earning revenue and with more on the horizon. So while we might consider seed funding, it's more to get strategic partnerships than for any other reason. Sure, sure. So let's, let's take a little step back and decode this for some of our listeners, and I'll, I'll, I'll play the part of the, the clueless questioner here, but help me understand, you know, 
I, I see valuations, fluctuations, yep. statements of, um, of value around cryptocurrency, and I have a hard time understanding what drives that or how to get a handle on any reliability or predictability in it. Sounds like that's what you're intimately involved in, but can you give it to me on like a third grade reading level? Yeah, the third grade answer is there's two problems in that question. One I have a good answer to, the other I don't. Okay. The one I have, I don't have a good answer for is what's the fundamental value of individual cryptocurrencies. So the best explanation on Bitcoin, for example, that I've seen was provided by a guy named Matt Levine. Matt Levine is a, a, a very good columnist for Bloomberg. He writes a column called Money Stuff, and yep. it's excellent. And he basically said, listen, if the use case for Bitcoin is it's going to replace gold, it's going to be digital gold, then its market cap, its total value, should be $8 trillion, because that's what the market cap of gold is. And arguably, considering the amount of monetary inflation or money printing by central banks, uh, maybe gold is cheap right now, so maybe even mm -hmm. more. On the other hand, if people don't accept it, it's gonna be worth zero, because it's either accepted or it isn't. So how do you value an asset that's either worth 20 plus times what it's worth well, today it, or zero. We've wandered into this philosophical territory of currency itself, which is a thought construct, and it's participatory. We have to agree that it has something. So That's I, correct. There, there's an unknowable element to that. But That's correct. Please continue. So the point is, is that if you look at what Bitcoin's worth, really its value is based on its percentage chance of being ultimately accepted as a store of value. And the more you believe that's true, the more you see ridiculous valuations that really aren't ridiculous of 250,000. And then people have made that statement. It's not, it's certainly a possibility. There's also a possibility that a newer, better technology turns Bitcoin into this generation's Betamax, yeah. right? So it could be worth zero. Valuing something that's essentially an option is very tricky. So that's the first question. Now there are other cryptos where the ability to provide a platform for smart contracts, for example, has an enormous value. Will Ethereum win? Will one of the newer ones win? Mm -hmm. Same question. So you have a lot of binary in this. The total market cap of crypto, in my opinion, is going to be many, many multiples, probably more than an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude larger than it is today. But will the ones that are driving that value be the ones that we know it today? I'm just not smart enough to know that answer. Yeah. So that's the first question to unpack. Yeah. But there is a second question, and it's important, and that's where we come in, which is, why does it move so much intraday? Why is it up, down, up, down, up, down? And the answer for that, frankly, is stupidity and ignorance. And it's, it's interesting, but I've seen this movie before. The stock market used to be like this. We saw it with program trading. We saw it in Japan in the 90s. We saw it in the United States in the 80s. The fact is, when you trade badly, you will move the market. If, if you decide you're going to buy or sell a thousand Bitcoin and a lot of people find out about it before you buy it, they're going to jam the price up or down right. depending which way you're doing it. Right. That's what's happening today. So the advent of companies like CoinRoutes with algorithmic strategies that can either find more liquidity when you want it fairly cheaply or float with the market intelligently are the way that it's going to decrease the volatility in that market. But until the 200 funds that are trading crypto and the 250 to 500 that are planned start using software like mine, well, we're going to still see these wild gyrations. Yeah, so you used a phrase a moment ago, trading badly, yeah. right? This is rooted in stupidity and ignorance. Yep. And you seem to offer an example of that, which is maybe tipping your hand, right? Yeah. An intention to buy a bunch, people know about it, because as we know, what's really valuable is not what it is, but what somebody else thinks it's worth tomorrow. Correct. Um, are there other examples of trading badly? Yeah, of those sadly, that, you've sadly there's a big one. The other example of trading badly is trading on single exchanges and trading in size. So I, I showed an example during my talk of an example, it was two weeks ago on a Sunday, and yes, one of the things about crypto is it trades liquidly 24-7. So on a Sunday, for no particular reason, somebody was obviously a large seller of Ethereum priced in Bitcoin and they drove the price down 17% in a span of three minutes on one exchange. 
And the reason that this happens is every exchange has a certain limited amount of bids or offers, in this case bids, in their system. And if you try to sell more than is on that exchange, the price can accelerate dramatically as you get past it. And if you don't access those bids on multiple exchanges, an order which could trade perfectly normally within a percent or two could cause a dramatically outsized market impact. And we've seen it. That's what causes so-called flash events. Mm -hmm. Now, and that's why crypto is so much more prone to flash events than equities, because in equities, you're not legally able to do that. You have to trade on multiple markets. Everyone has routing, mm -hmm. et cetera, to do that. Crypto doesn't. And so that's one of the reasons why routing was so attractive to me. Well, I watched the TV show Billions, so I'm totally qualified to talk about flash events and high frequency awesome. trading and all of that. I'm perfectly prepared for it. I, would it be fair to say that there are probably some really smart people who are making money off of these inefficiencies and bad behavior who are, might be kind of rooting against you or what Piles you're Piles of money and what, no one will say so out loud, but in their inner voice, of course the answer is yes. Yeah, they don't want this to make 100%. more sense. They want to keep it chaos. They want it to be the Wild West and you represent, I don't want to say normalization, but maybe rationalization of something that would level the playing field a little bit? We, we, we are seeing that. It's one of the things that we have complained about the most. There are a couple of the dominant exchanges who have terms of service in their market data agreements that make it hard for us to sell. We actually have a consolidated tape that I could sell very reasonably to everybody in the United States right now. But I can't sell it because I'd be violating their terms of service. What I can do is provide it to my customers for their personal use because we're only a SaaS company, a software mm -hmm. as a service. So mm -hmm. that's fine. But I can't sell it to non-customers of mine for trading because of those terms of use. Now, I would argue that those rules will, in fact, I know for a fact, those rules piss the regulators off. Yeah. Uh, I know this because I've seen them get angry, mm -hmm. but right now, until they're willing to do something about it, uh, they persist. So yes, we're already seeing it. So we bootstrapped to date, we've got patents pending, there's a lot of promising signs of what's to come. Tell me about the next three to five years. What's the vision? Well, the vision is actually very straightforward. Once we get through either seed funding or revenue, and it's a horse race in our case, the very next step is we're going to launch a network that we will not own, we will seed. Now that network is one of those things we talked about this morning in the presentation, a distributed autonomous network that we're seeding called RouteCoin. And what RouteCoin is, which is my favorite idea in 35 years in business, is very simple. Our router is being built with a memory. So let's say you want to sell 500 Bitcoin. You send me an order and let's say you use our algo strategy. So it's trading, but maybe there's 400 in reserve or in a dark pool if one comes available. And now, let's say your producer over there decides he wants to buy 300. It comes into our router and he wants to be aggressive. What our router will do is find the exchange or market which can intersect with the two of you and put up a midpoint price and trade it, helping both sides. That memory is a really cool concept. Now let's come up with the idea that, well, what if every router, not just ours, but every router being built by every software company, every hedge fund, every trading company, all have access to that same memory and could be shared. Well, the reason you wouldn't do that before today or before Routecoin is the, the risk that that information will cause that tipping your hand problem mm -hmm. we talked about. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've come up with a method for understanding what are cheating behaviors that could cause that. Yeah. And you will have to stake collateralize your participation in the network by RouteCoin, and if you are caught doing any of those cheating behaviors, you will lose your stake. That self-policing network, I think, is the future. And I think it will extend beyond crypto to equities eventually and other markets, because it's a better way for not just individuals, but institutions to be able to trade with each other with software intermediaries, not just mine, but everybody's software intermediary. So that's what the three to five year plan is to push that network. In the meantime, a routing company I think is going to be profitable and I think we will help people do it. But the real future is creating this idea of a distributed network. Well, two things that come up around that. One is, thanks for the quick shout out to producer Isaac. He probably would try to jam me up in the Bitcoin market. <laughs> Sounds like something he'd do. Uh, two is, that's a really big vision. You know, we're using terms that not everybody's familiar with. There's a little complexity in it. The way we're talking about it, we sort of backed into something that you just said that is 
really, really big. It's I believe it's a multi-billion shift. dollar idea, yes. Yeah, that's now, consider, what I'm Consider the fact that in my career, I built the first program trading system on the street. And you've probably heard of program trading, it's kind of a bit big. Yeah. And I was one of the first inventors on one of the first ETFs products called Opals back in the day. And ETFs are fairly big as well. The, the largest investment managers in the world are using ETFs. So, I kind of think I'm qualified to understand a big idea. <laughs> and this time, unlike the others, I actually believe that I'm in the position to potentially profit from it, and that's also good, just wish as opposed to making money for the companies I work for. I wish you'd just say what you really felt. It's so hard to get you to, to Yeah, I'm a shy, <laughs> retiring guy. <laughs> well, let, 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 let me ask you this, though, because I think this will make it really relevant to our listeners who are entrepreneurs, and they're growing companies, and they have portfolios, and they're you know, planning for their future and setting money aside. Many of them have you know, bits and pieces in crypto. That three to five year vision, that big vision you laid out, Mm -hmm. Even if they don't fully understand all of it, what would it feel like or what would its effects be to some of the broader community who's in this space or doing different things with their portfolios? Well, I think the most important point is it's a disruptive vision to the traditional way of trading. So what you're going to find is more technological augmented trading, which is already a trend. Yep. What you're going to find is less profit from firms who simply know the right people and have the networks of people that they do know, which right now drives a lot of the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of trading in every asset class is still done based on relationships. Now, relationships are always going to be important, don't get me wrong, and you need to be able to trust people, but that's disruptive. So what does it mean? It means that you will be the ability for people, entrepreneurs, to do build routing companies, to build mm -hmm. software that connects, mm -hmm. to trade and make their tokens available and get better liquidity for their tokens. It's a vision that allows institutions to participate where only retail players mm -hmm. trade today. So it's a hopeful vision from a liquidity point of view because at the same time I'm talking about this big vision, people in DC over the last six months have been talking about why aren't there more IPOs? Why are small yeah. cap companies not getting funded? Why do they trade so poorly? What can we do about that? And the answer is that there are things that need to be done and this is one way that yeah. potentially can help that. Well, it's huge. It's a big vision. Let's pivot here, move out of the, the specifics of what you're doing and shift to some general entrepreneurial growth management advice because you've been in the game and you've done different things and we've heard about some of that and a lot of our listeners are interested in applicable advice and practicalities. What are two or three things you've learned that you wish you knew 15, 20 years ago? Or <laughs> what, are, what are things that you advise up and coming folks, whatever they're in, as they're trying to grow and make their big visions come true? I think I'm going to sound like a self-help book and I apologize for that, but you learn more from things that fail and you learn more when you allow yourself to be wrong and you can pivot. So things that I find very important are entrepreneurs who don't listen to the people around them, refuse to pivot, refuse to understand when they're wrong, uh, will have a problem. I, I used to have an expression in a company I used to run, which my daughters have told me I have to change. The expression used to be, grown men don't argue over facts. <laughs> I'm told that that's misogynist and I'm a pig, so I can't say that uh, yeah, anymore. Now I, have to say, that. now I have to say adults don't argue there over you facts. Go. And uh, frankly, having two teenage daughters, both are in college, uh, they're right, so I can't really argue. But yep. the fact of the matter is don't argue over facts, find the facts, argue over nuance and opinions, and that's where you want to focus. And a lot of people spend a lot of time arguing over facts rather than researching them. Yep. And that becomes a very important thing. So things like pricing your product, you're not going to understand how to price your product until you're out in the marketplace with companies. You just can't. So you could model it as much as you want, but you need to actually get real data in order to do things. A data-driven approach becomes necessary and it's really hard to do. Being overly committed is a problem. One of the mistakes I made a long time ago was I tried to convince the entire US equity market that they were stupid and they should price in percentage or basis points instead of cents per share. Now the rest of the world, you should understand, prices outside yep. of the US and Canada, everybody prices in basis points or cents per share. I stubbornly stuck to this for a long time and it failed. And you know, it took a long time and it should have been pretty quick. We should have listened. Every one of our customers told us it was a bad idea. Well, you know, you make a good point about facts and the problem with facts is they can often disprove our assumptions and that doesn't feel good. 
Um, and it can also make others feel uncomfortable, which is related to the failure you just mentioned. Yep. The facts are the facts, but if nobody wants to face them, that can be a hard place to, to grow a business. That's uh, very true. I love it. Great advice. Dave Weisberger, Coin Routes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to South Pod, Rise of a Region where innovators dish on success, failure, and a rapidly evolving South.